Brethren, owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth his neighbor hath fulfilled the law. Words taken from today's epistle, St. Paul's letter to the Romans. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Most people are not that attracted to modern art. In fact, some people actually hate most modern art. In looking at most modern paintings or modern sculptures, the average viewer is often not attracted to the piece or is even completely unaware of its meaning or what it might be depicting. The viewer might comment that the art piece looks like a finger painting from some preschooler or something that perhaps came out from a junkyard. And why is this the reaction of many to modern art forms? It's because modern art, for the most part, suffers from problems of what is called formlessness, without form. Form is one of the elements of visual art that refers to the exterior shape of something. Proper form makes the art piece look more ordered, more recognizable, even more shapely and beautiful. Form pleases the eyes and the senses in general. And so when we look at Michelangelo's Pieta, we are attracted to it. When we see Raphael's Transfiguration or Da Vinci's Mona Lisa, it elevates, even idealizes things. These exterior forms are not just superfluous window dressing. But they help bring the viewer to the innermost meaning of that art piece. All things, in terms of our knowledge, come first through the senses. But many modern artists rejected the importance of exterior forms. Instead of focusing on beauty, order, and form, they began to focus in on the debased, the deranged, the disordered, the undefined, the undecipherable. And so the concept of formlessness, without form, without symbols, without shape, without perspective, order, and beauty, was introduced where art went from something highly decorative to something down and dirty. Thus, the pseudo-artists, Jackson and Pollock, would simply drip paint or even throw cans of paint onto a canvas that was laid out on the floor with even the ashes from the cigarette that Pollock smoked becoming mixed with the final product and called it art. Art became anti-art, or art with no form. All decor, all decoration had to be stripped away in favor of the impoverished. Anything rich in symbolism and exterior beauty and order had to be eliminated in order that we come to the bare essence, the shapeless. As G.K. Chesterton, the famous journalist, once observed, we used to have beautiful art for God's sake. It was all for God. Then we had beautiful art in the Renaissance for man's sake. Then we had art for art's sake. And now we have no art for God's sakes. <laughs> but what if this notion of formlessness without form entered into the liturgy of the church? into the Holy Mass and sacraments. In centuries past, some Protestant revolutionaries with a more puritanical zeal sought the wholesale abandonment of all ritual, all liturgy, and also ripping out anything beautiful from church buildings. History repeated itself, at least in part, as the new Mass became impoverished, liturgically speaking. And modern parishes saw various iconoclasts tear down the old and bring in the new. Get rid of that communion rail, the high altar. Bring in something new. And as a result of this destruction, the wondrous beauty, the order, the formality within our rituals and church buildings was largely lost. A traditional author of note has gone so far as to label it the heresy of formlessness, we have the word again, formlessness, where transcendence is replaced by the worldly, the profane. 
where the elevated is brought way down back to earth, where mysterious veils are completely removed, where sacred language for worship is replaced by more vulgar common words, everyday speech that you might use at Walmart, where soaring ceilings became replaced by drop ceilings, where chant evolves into hootenanny music, in short, where ugliness reigns, while beauty, order, and ritual are disdained. And therefore, impoverished liturgy is what most Catholics in the Latin Rite are used to every single Sunday. But thanks be to God, the traditional Latin Mass survived this assault of formlessness. The transcendent, the sacred, the mysterious are maintained in the older rituals with its formalities, its beauty, its symbolism, its order, its gestures, etc. And because form is kept, the content of the faith is kept along with all of its mystical significance. There is such richness in the old mass, just in the very movements and gestures, which some of you may not even see. In fact, all the mysteries of our salvation in Christ find symbolic expression in the traditional Latin mass. The adornment, the rich symbolism, the wondrous gestures, the sacrality of the language, the heavenly orientations always towards God, enrich the liturgy and help us grow in piety and in understanding, for as the Council of Trent taught, there is absolutely nothing superfluous in the traditional Latin Mass. Nothing superfluous. Since the publication of the Moda Proprio, the most recent one, Traditionis Custodis, I have not only become saddened by our Holy Father's assault on the ancient liturgy, but I've also become somewhat angry angry towards those who would seek the destruction of the most ancient, essentially unchanged liturgy the entire history of Holy Mother Church. What people is so barbarous that would seek to destroy its own past, like tear down a statue of Lewis and Clark, or tear down a statue of Teddy Roosevelt? Why not? What people would ever do that What people is so barbarous as to seek to destroy its own past? They have wasted our inheritance. They have trampled down our patrimony. They have stripped the liturgy of its beauty, impoverished it of its riches, and have given most Latin Rite Catholics an unsatisfactory replacement liturgy that was fabricated, non-organic, banal, on-the-spot product, cooked up by some liturgy professors in some room or even cafe. And so now we have a new liturgy that is tainted with the problem of formlessness. It was stripped. They stripped the liturgy of, of nearly all its traditional prayers. 83% of all the orations, the prayers were thrown out. Prayers that acknowledge the kingship of Christ over the temporal realm that Christ is king over this society, gone from all the liturgical texts in the New Rite. Those prayers against heretics and schismatics, gone. The conversion of non-believers, the necessity of the return to the Catholic Church and genuine truth was axed. Got to get rid of that. God's wrath for sin and the possibility of eternal damnation in hell gone. Our sins as being infinitely offensive to the Most High God tossed out. And why? Because modern man supposedly couldn't handle this. Such prayer offends his sensibilities. He likes to feel good about himself. And I'm angry what they've done to the liturgy. They remove so many gestures in the new mass, so many genuflections, gone. So many signs of the cross, gone. So many formalities and pieties disposed of. And now in many places we have butcher block altars like kitchen islands that are movable, 
unworthy the sanctuary. We have mass facing the people instead of God. That was never heard of until the French Revolution, where people would gather in a circle and worship themselves, adore human reason. Gone is the chanting by and large. Vernacular, everyday speech replacing the language of the angels. We have standing for communion. Stand before your God. We have receiving in the hand in most parishes. Girl altar servers, and even officially installed women as acolytes and lectors to replace any notion of the minor orders of male clerics in the past. We now have extraordinary ministers full of communion where everyone and their neighbors rush towards the altar to distribute and touch the holiest of elements. The body, blood, soul, and divinity of the Son of God and Son of Mary. Offertory prayers, the little canon they used to call it, so prefiguring of the sacrifice to come, the offertory prayers replaced God. Noise, noise, rarely silence. Lectionaries with edited readings or optional readings that can be avoided so that men might not be upset in this politically correct world. And we have these and so many other examples of a stripped down, impoverished liturgy that cannot even hold a candle to the mass of old. And yet the powers that would be wish to make the Novus Ordo Mise the unique, the one and only expression of liturgical prayer and the Lex Orandi in the Latin rites. I am angry. And if we are also being truthful, the Reformed liturgy is unacceptable to us. I do not accept the liturgical reform. It was a mistake and it was a travesty. But with all that being stated, we must remember this anger, even what we might perceive as being righteously angry, is not easily controlled and sometimes is out of place. Gentleness, kindness, and charity must be more present in us. You know, recently Holy Mother Church celebrated the feast of St. Francis de Sales, bishop and doctor of the church. He was a most extraordinary saint that wrote the strongest apologetical works defending the faith. And yet he was known for his gentleness, for his kindness. He was known for his love of neighbor. He famously said, you can catch more flies with a spoonful of honey than you can with a hundred barrels of vinegar. He also stated that if we must fall into some excess, let it be an excess of gentleness. He also added these words, quote, I wish to love my neighbor so much. I wish to love him so much. It pleased God so to make my heart. Oh, when shall we be impregnated with gentleness and in charity towards our neighbor, unquote. It is said that St. Francis de Sales converted between 60,000 and 72,000 Calvinists back to the one true faith. The Calvinists were a puritanical people with the zeal to destroy the mass, to strip the altars, to deface statuary, and to destroy the image of a loving God and the minds and hearts of men with their double predestination. Some men are just predestined to hell. They're reprobate from day one. Yet, St. Francis de Sales brought many of them home, not just through his orthodox writings and preaching, but also with his love, gentleness, and kindness. We cannot let our anger overwhelm us. We must love and be gentle 
as we try and persuade the membership of the church to return to and cling to tradition. And we must thank our Holy Father for this cross he has provided us with and also for providing us with so much clarity. Thank you, Holy Father. Because we now know that the ancient Mass and the new Mass are two different rites of Holy Mother Church and that they cannot coexist for long because they represent two ways of praying or two ways of believing that seem to be at odds. We traditional Catholics are referred to as being unreformed. Sounds like irredeemable, <laughs> deplorable, unreformed. Well, if being unreformed is being in line with the faith of the apostles and the saints of old, I will gladly wear that label. But let us not become like those prideful and callous Calvinists of old who embraced a self-righteous and harsh attitude. Traditionalists can become like them, celebrating their election while labeling anyone not of their number as part of the reprobate, the great unwashed. This battle, and it is a battle, this battle for the tr traditional mass and the traditional faith will be won by faithfulness and gentleness. And if there be any excess in our behavior actions, let it be an excess of gentleness and kindness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.